protein uh, inclusions within cells called Lewy bodies. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of them in a moment. And they're mostly in the brainstem, which is the core structure of the brain that kind of comes, connects up with the spinal cord. But it can be also in the cerebral cortex, higher centers of the brain. And in addition to the presence of Lewy bodies, which is considered, you know, the diagnostical um, sine qua non, there is no Parkinson's disease, idiopathic. Although there are some exceptions we can talk about maybe. Um, but there's also a loss of dopamine, in which it was, could only be measured about the 1950s onwards. We could measure dopamine because it was um, new techniques for measuring it became available. And the dopamine levels in the striatum, these deep gray structures, uh, were markedly diminished. And the cells that make dopamine and project their fibers to those deep gray structures they were dying, they were gone. So the combination of the decreased dopamine, the loss of dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra, and the presence of Lewy bodies, those are the criteria necessary to call the illness Parkinson's disease or idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So um, I think you can see, I just want to show you these first. And the animation doesn't work on this presentation, otherwise I would show that. But um, let's see. So you can see the substantia nigra, and the name is obvious, it's the black substance. This is freshly cut brain. If you freshly cut the brain and look at the midbrain, this is, see how small that is? There's where the midbrain is, cerebellum, and the rest of the brain is out here, it's been dissected away. In a patient with Parkinson's disease, there's pallor or paleness. A lighter shade of pale, right? paleness around the, substan of the substantia nigra, due to loss of the neurons that make dopamine that tend to have this pigment, neuromelanin. And what it looks like, these little lightning bolts are little pink bodies inside the surviving neurons. Those are called the Lewy bodies. They're protein lipid, with difficult to digest materials. And they also stain with other um, Antibodies. These are, this is done with antibody staining. I'm not going to get into how, but you can see them more readily. And because of the development of better ways of seeing Lewy bodies, we now know that those Lewy bodies are present for many years before the illness begins, most likely, because 8% of people who die without Parkinson's disease have these Lewy bodies. Is that predictive? Is that kind of the, what's below the surface? That, and then that the Lewy bodies can be found really throughout the brain. And their appearance has been studied. I'm going to show you um, in a series of brains at, uh, at different stages. So Brock and Brock published this uh, staging of the illness based on where the Lewy bodies were. So they looked at really large number of brains and looked at the distribution of Lewy bodies. And the earliest place that Lewy bodies are seen before the illness is actually diagnosed is in the olfactory bulb. This is the base of the brain, look at that from above. And this is where all the nerve fibers go to, that go to the nose. And your sense of smell, first way stop in the sense of smell is this olfactory bulb. And that's actually where the first Lewy bodies appear. They also appear way down in the vagal nucleus, way down in the brainstem. Which, you think about it, that's where the vagus nerve, which supplies the whole gut, uh, both output and input from gastrointestinal system. And so you wonder, could this be due to an environmental agent like a virus that is either ingested in the gut, absorbed, and then that virus travels up and causes these deposits? I'm just speculating. This is what people have said. Well, it begins in the olfactory bulb and in the brainstem. Very, and then those proteinaceous material uh, inclusions uh, migrate or involve. I, don't, it's, I shouldn't call it migrate, but the process of Lewy body formation advances with time until they appear in the midbrain. When it appears in the midbrain, that's when the first clinical manifestations begin to be noticed. So it looks like it's a much more global illness, and that, but the most vulnerable neurons that we, that we pay attention to are those in the midbrain because those then project to the whole deep gray structure called the striatum a structure that's part of a network responsible for the automatic execution of learned motor processing.
program. So, so when it hits a vulnerable spot, like the substantia nigra, you start noticing problems with movement. And there's a lot of ways you can see the time course of progression of these things. But if you look at, there's a way to visualize dopamine terminals in the brain. And that's called PET scanning. PET means, people say PET, well, it means positron emission tomography. Nothing to do with animals, right? But a PET scan is what you do when you like a puppy, right? No. No. What, you, what it is is the ingestion or administration of levodopa that's been labeled and it's taken up by nerve terminals and stored in little areas in the striatum and you see it like that as a signal. In a person with Parkinson's you see the loss of that signal. Now PETs can't, can't be done everywhere. You need a cyclotron because it's a positron emitting um, isotope. Uh, but now there's a new spec scan system that is going to be much more global that also measures this. So we'll be able to do this testing uh, in the future in any hospital with nuclear medicine. Um, what inter what's interesting, I have to look at mine, is that if you look at the decline in fluorodopa uptake, there's an index, that's what this curve is, it increases with age. It, I mean, the, the, there's a loss with age of dopamine um, storage of those dopamine terminals. Um, and it also correlates with the loss of neurons in years. So with time, we begin to lose neurons in the substantia nigra. This is based on post-mortem study, where cells are counted. This is based on living patients. And you know what? This is normal people. So with, with normal aging, they say from the age of 40 on, we begin to lose dopamine terminals. I thought we just began to live at that age. So I'll briefly talk, uh, let's see where we are, yeah, on the causes and pathogenesis, just in global terms, because it can be very, very complicate, complicated. An individual can spend his whole lifetime just looking at genetic determinants of the illness versus environment. And in fact, when I say genetics versus environment, it should be genetics interacting with the environment. It's not versus. The versus is just so-called dichotomy so that you can compare all the evidence for genetics and all the evidence for environment. In fact, it's the interaction of the two. Uh, the other aspect of the illness dealing with pathogenesis is the observation that the energy warehouses, the energy factories of cells are compromised. Those are called mitochondria. Mitochondria are subcellular organelles that are very, very dynamic, very essential for generating energy. It's where the fuel is combined with oxygen to yield a chem chemical kind of energy. And in Parkinson's disease, that whole process is impaired. And um, that was first discovered by studying the effects of a neurotoxicin in uh, animal models. That was MPTP. But it then was found to hold true for Parkinson's disease itself. So there's a bioenergetic problem due to mitochondrial deficits. So there's a lot of interest, and I think Dr. Hauser will be speaking about this more, about neuroprotective agents that may improve uh, mitochondrial function or that enhance um, the antioxidative function of cells. So, Because as you generate, you imagine you're generating all this energy, there's a lot of exhaust called oxyradical, superoxyranine, that is toxic, and there's a natural way to scavenge that. And sometimes that's not adequate where, and creates a state of oxidative stress. And so that's why you've heard of high-dose antioxidant treatments. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. And sometimes when the mitochondria start dysfunctioning, they put out a signal and say, OK, throw in the bag. Let's have an orderly death here. Apoptosis is death of a cell that's very clean and neat. And uh, it's called programmed cell death. And that's linked to mitochondrial deficits. Apoptosis is a natural process that happens during development, especially, and as we age. Oh, I keep on going to the wrong thing here. Uh, excitotoxicity is really going even 
further into the processes that lead to apoptosis of cells. And, and a lot of these uh, notions of excitotoxicity are important because there are drugs. Excitotoxicity is a, mediated by excessive glutamate activity. And glutamate is one of them, is a neurotransmitter, just like dopamine is, but it stimulates cells. And when there's excessive glutamate release or activation of glutamate receptors, the cells can undergo a series of changes that result in cell death. And so there are agents that may be useful in slowing the progression of disease that are anti-excitotoxic, anti-glutamate drugs. And the other aspect about pathogenesis is, and I find this very interesting in our lab, is really starting to focus on this more, is on the role of the brain's immune system. Uh, the microglia are supportive cells that you see in the brain, but they're immune cells. Whenever there's any inflammation, uh, when I say infection, or injury or perturbation of the nervous system, the microglia change, become, become activated. They're almost like the National Guard, and then they become activated to, uh, and mediate a number of things. I'm not going to get into all of it. Uh, microglia are activated and increase in number in areas where there's an injury. So the microglia, you should not be surprised to hear this, are very active in the substantia nigra. And the microglia are very active in the striatum. And it's believed to be a response to the injury, but some people have postulated maybe the microglia themselves are not normal. The other uh, aspect about microglia, and you, something that's interesting, and the inflammatory process that underlies this disease, is that there was a little study recently on people who took Motrin. Ibuprofen had less likelihood of developing Parkinson's disease. I'm not saying everyone should be on it, but, and that's epidemiological, it's an association, there's no, but that was very recently discussed. So that maybe developing the right kind of anti-inflammatory agent early on. So one of the interesting things that's happening, we're looking at inflammatory changes. Now, when I talk about inflammation, that's the response to some kind of invader or some kind of injury. It could be a bacterial invasion, viral invasion, or trauma, just really bad injury, and the whole immune system becomes active. That results in signs and symptoms of inflammation. So there is a brain inflammation that's going on, um, and it can be picked up by blood samples, maybe early on. And so we're doing a project at USF uh, where we're looking for biological markers of inflammation in early Parkinson's disease. And that might be a way to follow the disease progression and it may be a target for new treatments. I'm not going to talk much more about genetics and environment because I'm running short of time, other than to say that there is at least, oh, I think, 9 to 12 mutations associated with Parkinson's disease. The problem is it's still the rare thing. Um, if you look at these mutations in a whole number of so-called idiopathic Parkinson's disease, they don't have these mutations. The first one was called the uh, alpha-synuclein mutation, which is intriguing because alpha-synuclein is a protein that's produced at nerve endings, at synapses, that accumulates an abnormal form in the Lewy body. So that Lewy body that's the marker pathologically of the disease is loaded with alpha-synuclein. So when you saw a mutation of alpha-synuclein, it was very exciting. It means if you have a disease that's genetic, that runs in every generation, like in this autosomal dominant disease. There's abnormalities in synuclein handling, and that results in Lewy bodies that underlie the disease. So that's one of the interesting things about this mutation. However, this mutation is extremely rare. I've never seen a patient with autosomal dominant Parkinson's disease. Um, It's been found only in five families, but if you overexpress this gene, you can also uh, develop Parkinson's disease. So right here I listed the ones that are common. Nine genetic sites of mutations have been identified, and five pathogenic genes have been identified. And it's the alpha-synuclein, the Parkin mutation, DJ1, PINK1, LARC1, etc. But as I say, uh, there are some tests for, for these now uh, through Athena diagnostics. We can test for about three of these. The environment, I'm going to skip. I want to go now, I'm going to skip treatment 
the environment is very 